Welcome to the non-paradoxical twin paradox explained. The twin thing refers to an effect entailed by Einstein's theory of relativity, which produces different clock speeds for bodies in relative motion, and in the popular allegory, causes twins to age differently when one makes a visit to a different star system. The traveling twin returns significantly younger than the stay-at-home twin. I'll call it the twin effect from here on because I intend to show that there is no paradox. The effect has inspired lots of videos on YouTube with various interpretations. Surprisingly, there is a resistance to accepting that it's a real effect, and even where it's recognized as real, there's often a resistance to accepting it as being due to acceleration. Some theorists rely on elaborate equations to try to show that purely relative relationships can result in actual differences in aging. But I'm going to show geometrically that acceleration, which is not relative, is actually key to understanding the effect. I'll also address an overlooked and seemingly unsolvable related paradox. How can periods of relative motion between periods of acceleration in one twin's journey, during which each would be observing the other's clock speed to be moving more slowly, be reconciled at their reunion? This would not be a problem with a flyby, but when the twins are brought together, there would have to be an accounting problem if both insist the other's clock has been moving more slowly and that consequently each would have to be younger than the other. In order to understand the twin effect, one algebraic equation and some simple geometry are all that are needed. The Lorentz transformation is the equation that describes the relationship between clock speeds of bodies in relative motion. Someone familiar with the Lorentz equation might object that in this example, the term v squared should be expressed as v squared over c squared, but by stipulating that v is proportional to the speed of light, that complication is made unnecessary. Someone might object that other popular complications have been left out of the equation, but as you'll see, those two will be unnecessary. The term TA here refers to the clock speed of an observer called A, and the term TB is the clock speed of an observer called B. If the time elapsed for A is 10 seconds and B is moving at 80% to the speed of light, which is universally designated with the letter C, so in other words, moving at point A times C, then by taking the algebraic steps displayed here, the clock of B will be found to tick only 6 seconds relative to A's. 10 seconds. Incidentally, as you probably know, the slowing of clock speed. time dilation. Here is the Lorentz transformation rendered with geometry. I go into the difference between this diagram and the popular but mistaken Minkowski diagram in another video at the link displayed below, but it's not important for an understanding of the twin effect. The horizontal line here represents the three dimensions of space. The vertical line is the dimension of time. Together, the four dimensions are referred to as space-time, which is recognized in relativity theory as indicating that space and time are interrelated. The vectors representing the motions of A and B in space-time are called world lines. Using the example of the Lorentz equation, Shown again here, observer A is considered to be at rest with B in relative motion, moving at 0.8 times the speed of light. Observer A's clock ticks 10 seconds in the time span covered by the diagram, while B moves 8 light seconds in space with a clock speed of just 6 seconds. The correlation of space and time can be seen in the way B's world line moves partly in A's space dimension and only partly in A's time dimension. Notice that the dashed line, which represents how far B moves in A's time frame, shows the slowing or dilation of the clock speed of B relative to A. There is another aspect of the relationship displayed here that will be revealing. There is a perfect right-angled Euclidean triangle formed by the relationship between the space-time vectors of A and B. Because the world line of B forms a hypotenuse of the right triangle formed by B's relative motion in space and time, it follows that the world line of B is necessarily equal in length to the world line of A, which has the same relationship to the space-time components of B's motion as does a hypotenuse. In principle, therefore, it can be said that all unaccelerated world lines are equal in length. This will be important in understanding the twin effect. 
A seeming absurdity of special relativity has always been the principle that two observers in relative motion will, in the same circumstance, each measure the other's clock to be moving more slowly than their own. A first step in coming to an understanding of how this can be explained geometrically is to recognize that if the world line of observer B is as shown at an angle from A's world line, B is equally justified in considering herself to be at rest with A in relative motion. So, B's orientation to space must be, like A's orientation, perpendicular to her own motion in time. So the space axis X prime of B is perpendicular to the world line of B. Now to get B's perspective of A, as A is observing B, we need only draw B's space axis X prime to a point where a perpendicular can be drawn to A's position in time. The two observations can thus be seen to mirror each other, and each is equally valid because of their reciprocal orientations in space-time. A rotation of the diagram shows this clearly. From B's perspective, it is A who is moving more slowly in time. There is no difference between the observations by each of the other's motion and clock speeds. With uniform motion, there is no actual difference between the agings of A and B. Two twins in relative motion would each regard the other as aging less, and this could never be an in-person paradox, because if they are in relative motion, they will forever move apart. Acceleration, unlike uniform motion, or as it's called, the state of rest, is not relative. A ball inside a spacecraft that is floating freely in space will likewise float freely within the spacecraft's cabin. If the craft is accelerated, the ball will immediately move to the wall or floor that is opposite the direction of acceleration and press against it as long as the acceleration continues. Acceleration is thus absolute and distinguishable from a state of uniform motion or state of rest. I'm going to ignore the topic of gravitational acceleration here as it is not necessary to understand the twin effect. The point is, if it is evident that one twin is accelerating and the other is not, then there is a non-relative difference, an absolute difference between them, and it will be possible for an accelerating twin to accelerate away to a distant star, decelerate to a stop, and accelerate back again, younger than the stay-at-home twin. For some reason, some theorists insist that it is not acceleration that will create a disparity between ages of the twins, but the change in reference frames when the traveling twin turns around. That's much like saying it's not the fall that hurts, it's a sudden impact with the sidewalk. Acceleration is produced by a force, and as this diagram shows, it causes the body to move out of time and into space. Real time dilation is concurrent with real and extended acceleration, not an instantaneous clock switching due to a change in direction. As can be seen here, acceleration involves a curved world line. Unlike a body in uniform, unaccelerated motion, the world line of observer Z is moving partly in space and correspondingly less in time, out of time and into space with a curving or swerving in space-time as she accelerates due to an application of force. A curved world line will thus move less in time than one moving perpendicular to space. If we were to rotate the diagram to get observer Z's perspective, it wouldn't show a simple mirroring as with two observers in relative motion. Z is accelerating absolutely. Z's clock is of course accelerating along with Z, so except for the experience of being forced against a wall, Z will notice nothing unusual on board her spacecraft. Z's clock will seem to be ticking normally, uniformly, just as if it were at rest perpendicular to space. And from Z's perspective, it will be A and B that seem to be accelerating, and their clocks will be observed moving faster than Z's. So the difference between Z's perspective and others that are not accelerating or not accelerating at the same rate is not reciprocal as with relative uniform motion, it is inverse. It must be noted that the accelerations shown here are not realistic. The human could not survive anything close to an acceleration with an observable relativistic intensity. 
Our experience of gravitational acceleration at the Earth's surface is less than 10 meters, or 30 feet, per second squared, and many of us find even that burdensome. I'll return to this later, but for now, the extreme accelerations are useful to illustrate the nature of acceleration. As this diagram shows, the spacetime orientation of an accelerating body involves a continuous change. Z's clock is, at each moment of its acceleration, moving less in time and more in space than in its previous orientation. At the instant of forces removed, a body retains the uniform relative velocity it had achieved by its acceleration. It maintains the perpendicular orientation of time to space it has attained at that instant, now rotated from the orientation it had before the acceleration. In this diagram, Z accelerates away from A, decelerates at the destination, accelerates back, and decelerates again into the original space-time orientation that it shared with A, but at a younger age than A, because of the accelerations. This is the exact situation as described in the standard twin paradox for those who acknowledge that it requires accelerations, not just relative motion. There remains a difficulty with determining how arbitrary periods of uniform motion interspersed with accelerations can be resolved upon the twins' reunion, when each would have been able to observe with cameras the other's clock to be moving relatively slowly. We'll start with a return to the first diagram, but with years and light years and a 3-4-5 relationship instead of 6-8-10 in seconds. To review, a thought experiment with twins that attributes the peculiarity of time dilation to acceleration works fine when the traveling twin is constantly accelerating and is not really a paradox, as it can fully account for the differences in age at the reunion. But if the traveling twin spends any time during the journey moving uniformly, the principle of special relativity applies, and each twin will regard the other's clock as being only relatively dilated during such periods. Any time in relative motion between accelerations introduces this conundrum. If each twin has been observing the other's clock moving relatively slowly during any part of their separation, how can their clocks agree on that part of the journey? How can the mutual observation of the other's relative dilations be resolved when they are reunited? So let's begin with the moment B shuts off her engine and enjoys a period of uniform motion. Having achieved a relative velocity compared to A, they will be observing by means of cameras that the clock of each is moving more slowly than their own. This can go on for an extended period of time, so that by the time the traveling twin returns, there is a substantial amount of clock dilation to reconcile. Given the absolute effects of acceleration already discussed, and given the entirely relative effects of unaccelerated uniform motion, any uniform motion that might be included in a test of the so-called twin paradox can be considered in isolation from the acceleration. This diagram takes the perspective of a stay-at-home twin A's coordinate system. World lines A1 and B1 represent the space-time paths of the twins and the uniform part of twin B's journey to a distant star system, according to twin A. Vectors A2 and B2 are the world lines of the twins in the uniform part of B's return trip, also according to twin A. As in the diagram that illustrated uniform relative motion, the Pythagorean 3-4-5 relationship that obtains from a relative velocity of 0.8c is used for the sake of clarity and simplicity. At the five-year mark on A's clock corresponding to her observation of the uniform part of B's journey away, the clock of the latter indicates that he has begun his deceleration near the destination after three years of moving uniformly. Following his deceleration and acceleration for the return home, he coasts for three years before beginning his deceleration to Earth, where both agree that six years of uniform motion have elapsed. This takes some concentration to understand. According to A, B's clock is at three years when A's is at five, but B will have already began his return two years prior to A's corresponding time of five years. So in the end, they both agree that B has spent six years moving uniformly while A was waiting at home for six years. 
Note the twin B's vectors are drawn to intersect the space-time points of destination and reunion for the sake of clarity, but it would be the decelerations subsequent to the uniform segments that would actually mark those arrivals. It is the abstraction from B's travels that has made the symmetry of their uniform periods evident. The change in direction, which some theorists claim is responsible for the twin effect, is actually incidental. But, as you may have noticed, there are several indications that the diagram is an imperfect representation of relativistic two-way periods of uniform motion in space-time. The diagram here isn't rotatable, as was the original diagram. To accurately treat two reference frames that separate and reconverge, it would be necessary to somehow balance their perspectives. Otherwise, the time dilation observed by one is treated as more real than the other. Twin A is portrayed as having been absolutely at rest, and twin B as in absolute motion in the unaccelerated segments spanned by the diagram, with no way to rotate or balance their roles, because one twin reverses directions by an acceleration, while the other maintains her continuous direction in space-time. One world line thus forms an angle, and the other does not. Another problem is that the sum of the links of the twins' world lines are not equal. B's are 5 plus 5 units long, A's is just 6 units long. So although I think the diagram is essentially correct in showing that the relative motion can produce time dilation, it needs to be supplemented. Given the distortion here of representing relative motion in a way that can't be seen as relative, it can be useful to consider a perspective on the twins that can relativize their relationship even though the perspective is physically impossible. This diagram takes an unnatural but more comprehensible mirroring and transcendent perspective as of a demiurge or, if you prefer, a God's eye view of the spatial relationship between the twins. It illustrates that except when twin B is accelerating but is considered moving uniformly, Twin A can't simply be considered at rest with twin B in motion. Rather, both are actually relatively at rest and relatively in motion. This serves to balance the to and from segments of twin B for the sake of clarity, showing that equal periods of relative motion are unable to produce time dilation in B's clock. But the periods of uniform motion amid accelerations to and from needn't even be equal for the final reckoning of clocks to be in agreement. Given the correlative relationship between clocks shown here, the convergent vectors could have a different length than divergent vectors. And actually, there needn't be any uniform motion at all in one of the directions for concurrency to be maintained. Such a situation can be envisioned as involving only one period of uniform motion using one pair of the vectors here vectors a1 and b1, or vectors a2 and b2. In each case, no matter how long or how relatively fast the uniform motion in either direction, in the end there is always a correlation between clocks. A return to the earlier diagram illustrates this. If b returns to the origin of his departure from a in uniform motion, the correlation with a's clock is complete. In conclusion, the twin effect is a real effect of acceleration, not of uniform motion, and not of a reversal of trajectory. But it may be disappointing to recognize that even if a traveler accelerates in 1g for a period of years, equal to the effect of gravity on Earth, and a maximum physically sustainable acceleration for a human traveler, it would require a vast and impossible quantity of fuel and it would only match the homebody's acceleration in 1g on Earth due to Earth's gravity. There would therefore be no difference in age between them for all the trouble. And ironically, the additional factor of time dilation in a gravitational field, which the homebody would undergo, but not the traveler, means that the stay-at-home will be the one to age less, although only by a small amount. So the twin paradox has been shown to be a non-paradox, entirely explicable in terms of acceleration according to relativity theory, but entirely unsupported by theories of effects of uniform motion or the reversal in trajectory. Unfortunately, the intriguing idea that actual time dilation could result in a significant difference in aging 
between a traveler and a stay-at-home cannot be realized. Well, thank you for watching and listening. I welcome comments, questions, and criticisms.